right, good morning. Welcome. It's good to see everyone this morning. It's uh, always great to see the kids in worship, and now they head to learn about the Lord themselves. My name is Buck. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we've been going through a series the last few weeks called Legacy, and, and if you've been at Bedrock at any amount of time, you know that we have a desire to make a big deal about the gospel of Jesus Christ, about the legacy of Jesus. We want to expand that legacy, and we want to continue that legacy. And so this morning, we're going to be in Joshua chapter 4. But before we get to Joshua chapter 4, I, I got a picture for you. I, I'm curious, does anyone know who this is? I can drop some hints, put some pressure on some of our psychology or psychologists in the room. Uh, he's not super famous, but no one knows who this guy is. Well, this guy, his name is Stanley Milgram, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this room is aware of one of Stanley Milgram's hypotheses, and it's simply this. He wanted to see, or he wanted to make a connection of people on the planet, how many links does it take to connect everyone? We know this as six degrees of separation. So what Stanley Milgram discovered was that he was going to figure out how many links does it take to connect people. So he ran this experiment. Here's the experiment. He had a few hundred people from Boston and Omaha try to get a letter to a target, a complete stranger in Boston. But they could only send the letter to a personal friend whom they thought was somehow closer to the target than they were. When Milgram looked at the letters that reached the target, so they get to the target, when he looked at them, he found that they had only changed hands six times. That's where we come up with this idea of six degrees of separation. Now, some of you are like, oh, that's so nerdy. So let's just do the pop culture thing. You guys know this guy? Right, right, right. It's, it's, it's Kevin Bacon. And if you're in your 40s, we all know who Kevin Bacon is, right? All right, so Kevin Bacon, just to continue this idea of six degrees of separation, it was in pop culture called Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon because it was this idea that, that you could connect anyone in Hollywood through six links of people to this guy, to Kevin Bacon, because he'd been in so many random movies. He's worked with so many different people. But the idea, again, even big picture, the world, or even smaller subculture, um, the, the arts, the uh, movie industry still could be connected. And you're like, what does this have to do with anything? Let me show you this picture. Well, well, I've been thinking about this a lot. I, what, what I'm trying to do is I want us to understand so the world can seem really big. Like right now we're almost at 8 billion people on the planet. And I realized in 1967 there wasn't 8 billion people, so technically it may be 9 degrees of separation now. I don't know what it is. But the idea is that this world, as big as it is, it could be shrunk, right? I want to do that with the Christian world this morning. You, you see this word cloud, and you see all kinds of Christian words on there, ideas on there. And, and what I want us to do is I want us to see that all of these words that describe the Christian faith, all these words that are a part of the Christian faith, they can do one of two things. They can weigh you down and discouragement, maybe lack of knowledge, or maybe even lack of obedience to these things, or they can absolutely free you. Because once you start to understand the why we do what we do, instead of making the onus or the, the emphasis on this is what I do, let's understand today why we do what we do. And in a nutshell, we do everything we do as believers for one reason. That's it, one reason. This isn't earth shattering. You all know the answer, but we rarely think about it. We do all things for the glory of God. The glory of God has to be our motivation. And until or unless it is, these things, the doing, the reading scripture, the witnessing, the being an evangelist, the helping the poor, whatever the Christian is called to do, all of those things will be a weight. Unless, unless you're motivated to do them for the glory of God. And that's it. And so I want to shrink, I want to shrink the Christian faith down this morning of what we understand it to be. 
let's just come back to its roots, the glory of God. And we're going to see in Joshua, we're going to see that the glory of God has always been the intent for God and man, that man would proclaim his glory, experience his glory, demonstrate his glory. Here's what's crazy. If we make these words our pursuit, obedience, reading the Bible, memorizing the Bible, going to church, whatever's on your religious list, if you make those primary, you will be crushed by the weight of sin, by the weight of religion. And here's how I know it. I've talked to many of them. I've had many conversations. Elders have had many conversations where, where Christians have lost that joy, that, that meaning and that purpose. And, and, and there's a common theme. It, it's, I'm not doing this right. I'm not doing this well. I've done this. I haven't done that. And by the way, all those things matter. But this morning, I want you to ask, why do I do that? Why? Because I'm supposed to? Because it's the right thing to do? Or am I motivated by the glory of God? This isn't a problem just for the, uh, our century of church. Um, if you look at Matthew 11, let's just look at the pas- passage in Matthew 11. Jesus is talking to a group of people that have been taught by the Pharisees. And they're weighed down by religious duty and activity. This is how you be godly. And so they're weighed down by it. And here's Jesus' response. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. He says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lonely in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is saying to follow him. This is what it means. And he's telling it to a people that have been weighed down by religion. He's like, I want to set you free. I read a letter it was, a, it was a published letter of a pastor who had resigned, and, and he gave all of his reasons. And, and we know pastors resign all the time from burnout and all those things, and, and, and Christians step away from the faith from burnout. I don't think it's from burnout. I think it's from works. I think it's from religion. I really do. I'm not saying we don't get tired. I'm not saying that we don't um, get discouraged. But I am saying that living for the glory of God is a lot different than doing religious activity. And so with that mindset, let's just jump in to our passage this morning. And let's really consider what's happening. Give you a little background. We're in Joshua 4. All right. In Joshua 4, we're at the Jordan River. The people have been led free from, from Egypt. They've wandered around. And Moses had already sent a delegation of 12 people, one from each tribe. And they go and they check out the promised land. And 10 of the 12 come back and say, it's too scary. There's giants over there. There's no way we can do this. They were discouraged. But two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, God promised us, let's go do it. Guess who won? The majority, right? The democracy. (laughs) So they don't don't obey God. And guess what happens to that entire generation? They never inherit the promised land. They all die in in the wilderness. They never make it to the promised land. Can, can, I, can I throw something out that I think I've experienced over the years? I think there's a truism. In the faith life, I've found that in the faith life that, that genuine believers can come together, but it's usually only a minority of them who are willing to step out in faith. And it doesn't mean it's always the same minority, right? So I'm not saying there's an elite group of Christians. I'm just saying usually when there's an opportunity to respond in faith, usually the majority is like, no, no, let's stay here. But there's always a few that are like, let's go. Let's go do this. And so that generation misses it out. The next generation comes, and now they're at the Jordan River. And remember, the promise was, I'm going to lead you out of Egypt. I'm going to take you to the promised land, and you guys are going to make my name great. This is what the Lord has desired for them. And so, so we're in Joshua 4, and this is what is happening. As we go through, we see in Joshua 4 that, that as they begin to cross the Jordan, the priests have 
into the river, and as they step into the river, it starts to dry up. The ground starts to dry. The river starts to separate. Does this sound like anything familiar? Sounds just like the Red Sea experience, right? If you have not figured this out about Scripture, it's all interconnected. I had someone after the first service come up to me and say, I had no idea that the Passover was connected throughout the New Testament. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that's the whole point of all this. All this is connected, right? So, so we come back, and, and now we're at the Red Sea, and it's parting. And you know this generation. They weren't there, but you know they know the story of the Red Sea. And they're like, whoa, God's done this before. So here he goes again, right? And so he's doing this miraculous thing. And as this is occurring, they get, they're passing through, and then they're told to grab some stones out of the river. They're told to grab one stone per tribe. So there's 12 tribes of Israel. So they grab a stone, and then eventually they're going to build this memorial. And they build this memorial for what? To be reminded of what God has done. All right? Can I ask you a rhetorical question? What miracle have you seen God do? None of you are like, I saw him do the river, the James River this weekend. Can I just, can I maybe just take our thoughts a little bit different? I need you to know this, that if you're a believer, that you are genuinely saved, salvation is a miraculous act of God in your life. And I'm only making this point, when was the last time you thought about it being a miraculous work of God? Isn't it so easy to forget what God does? Like, it really is easy to, to experience all this goodness, the river parting, we're in the promised land, or, or to be given life and salvation, to be forgiven, to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit, all these realities so real, and we forget about them. It's a human problem, all right? So we, we see it here in the Jordan, we saw it in the Exodus, we see it all throughout Scripture, and then obviously I think we all would agree that we tend to forget God's amazing work in our own lives. And so they're called to grab these 12 stones and, and, and to build a memorial so that the people will know what God has done. With that being said, let's look at Joshua. We'll be in Joshua 4, 19 through 24. And this is what we read from the scriptures. The people came out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Do you ever consider that God has a mission? He has a desire, and that mission is really this. That, that the people that he's made, the image bearers that he made, worship him. And the thing about worshiping God is it, it's not a burden. It's actually what we were made to do. In fact, it's freeing to do it. But that leaves a question for us as a religious people. Why do so many people who profess Christ have no affinity for the things of the Lord? What I mean by that, the gathering of believers. We talk about de-churching and all these other things. There's some sort of disconnection. I'm convinced of this. Uh, people aren't walking away from the faith. They're walking away from religious activity. There's a big, big difference. And so this morning, is maybe you're in here wrestling, and you're trying to figure out, am I really a believer? Am I really following Jesus? I'm not making light of that at all. I'm encouraging you. Wrestle with that. But I want to help you this morning to understand the difference between the faith and religion. The difference between duty to religion and faithfulness to God. Because that difference is everything. 
It's everything. God wants his people to make this memorial so they won't forget what he has done. And what has he done? He's rescued them. The story of God is one big rescue story all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Look with me real quick. We just think about Abraham. We think about Abraham, right? In Genesis chapter 12, we read this in verse 3. The Lord says, and in you all the families of the world. All the families of the world shall be blessed. It's always been God's plan to redeem the whole world. Always been his plan. He continues, the scriptures continue, that God is rescuing different people in the exodus itself. There's an idea, right, that that the exodus is God rescuing his Hebrew people from Egypt. Right? And, that, and then he rescues them, and he's going to bring them into the wilderness, eventually into the promised land. That's all true, but that's not the full story of the Exodus. We know from Scripture that it wasn't just the Hebrews that were rescued on this journey. Did you know that? It wasn't just the Hebrew people that were rescued. If you look real quick in Exodus 9, I'll read it for you. But in Exodus 9, 16, For this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. This is why the exodus is occurring, that his name, that his glory would be proclaimed in all the earth. Now look what happens. God says this is why it's happening, and then God says, proved it to you. You see this in Exodus 12. Three three chapters later, we read 1238. A mixed multitude also went up with them. And very, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. That mixed multitude were Egyptians. That mixed multitude were exposed to the holy God of all things. And they followed with the Hebrew people out of Egypt into the wilderness. Amen. God's always been about people of the world. And so this story, whether it's Abraham, whether it's the Exodus, of course we understand in Acts when the church is first established, what happens? We see, we see God declaring to us how he is going to use his church to redeem, to be a tool of redemption for people in this earth. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. You will be my witnesses. Can I just paraphrase? You will be my memorial to the world that I am who I say I am. Brother, sister, that's what it means to be a Christian. The glory of God is the desire of your heart. And yet there's so many distractions, so many things in our lives that are trying to rob us from those, from that purpose of the glory of God. And and, and you know how good deception is? Deception is so good that we go to church, that we be moral, that we do all the things we're supposed to do. But it's a checklist as we continue to pursue our lives and our wants. Crazy how easy it is to manipulate faith. That's what people are walking away from is that fakeness. But to really embrace Jesus and to experience what is happening, Jesus says that is joy, that is meaning, that is purpose, that is easy. Because he's the one that carries the burden of it all. Some of you came into the lobby and you noticed a pile of rocks. Anyone notice a pile of rocks? Anyone trip over the pile of rocks? Anyone? First service, I think we are about to be sued a couple times. But if that was you, if you did happen to trip over the rocks, just email James. He deals with all of our litigation. All right? No, the rocks, why are they there? Why are they there? Honestly, the only reason why those rocks are there is for you to say, why are those rocks there? Did it work? Maybe. No, what? the rocks are there to get us to ask the why. And this morning, I just want us to ask the why. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Whatever it is. Why are you doing what you do? What's your motive? Those rocks, maybe this morning, they'll be a reminder of all the good things that God has done. A reminder 
that God wants us as believers to declare all the good things that he's done. Maybe that's what those rocks are there for this morning. My hope is that every day, every day, that we will ask, how does the world see the glory of God in me? Can I tell you something? It, there's no doubt that it's nice to, to do good things, to do good works, and we're called to do those things. There's no doubt that those things are influential and they absolutely matter. But I'm absolutely convinced that the glory of God is going to be seen more in your life by the way that you respond when you're wronged, by the way that you respond when you are misrepresented, by the way you respond when things don't go your way than they ever will you giving 15 pairs of shoes to go to Philadelphia. And I'm not minimalizing those shoes. What I want us to understand this morning is the Christian faith is more about our attitude toward the Lord than our actions. Actions matter, but the actions that are void of a godly attitude is just religion. It's just religion. And we know this, right? How many of you got tattoos in here? I was going to make a joke I shouldn't have made. <laughs> like sinners. I don't believe that, by the way. <laughs> that, that was 30 years ago. So, so the th cool thing about tattoos for me is, I mean, I, I'd like to talk. So when I see tattoos, I'm like, oh, what's that tattoo for? And every single time I ask someone, they're like, oh, it means this. Like there's a reason why someone got the tattoo that they got. And, and usually there's a kind of deeper meaning, not every time, but there's a deep meaning why they had that tattoo tattoo. Like we, all I'm trying to make the point is that we're good at making memorials. We know how to do that. Did a wedding yesterday. What's the wedding ring represent? It's a memorial. It says I'm married. That, like we know what memorials are. I just want us to engage this. If you're a believer in this room, God wants you to be a memorial to his glory with your lives. That's all that's happening. That's all our passage is, is talking about. It's all we've been talking about the last four weeks. Not building, not, not anything other than the glory of God. And we do that as a body together. Last week we talked about being living stones, being built upon one another. Guys, we, we have to acknowledge this. Our culture doesn't embrace that. You understand that, right? We're Americans. I love being American, by the way. But we're incredibly individualistic, right? The Christian faith is interdependency. It's community. And so our own culture builds up a hindrance to faithfulness to Jesus. All right? So we're going to have to work through and understand what this means. Look with me. Back in 19, the people came out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. Now, this is really crazy. So the 10th day, the 10th day of the first month, you know what day that is? Passover. It's going to become the Passover. And you remember what the Passover was? They're coming. Before they left Egypt, God tells them, put blood on your doorpost. And everyone who puts blood on their doorpost, the death angel will pass over them, and their firstborn will be saved. Get that? Blood firstborn saved all right this is good <laughs> so they entered the promised land on passover they passed through the jordan they entered the promised land on passover passover is a memorial and a remembrance to what god has done in other words just as the people in in egypt had to trust god by randomly putting blood up on a doorpost. I mean, think about how random that is. But by faith they did it. God fulfilled that promise. God told the priest, put your toes in the water and it will dry up. It was flooding. I didn't tell that part of the story. The Jordan's flooding. It's spread out and they're told to cross it. And the first response is, it's too deep. It's too wide. No, put your toes in the water. And they did. And the water begins to part. God can be trusted. God can be trusted. And so, so they enter on the 10th day of the first month.
And they build this memorial as a reminder of everything that's been done. This morning, I want us to recognize how we share moments of God's faithfulness. That we're called to share these moments of God's faithfulness. We're called to do this because it brings glory to God. Verse 21 through 23. And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, What do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel passed over the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters in the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. These stones, they're a reminder. They're a declaration of God's goodness. They're a declaration of God's trustworthiness. Got our communion cups. I mentioned this in the first service. This is not how they did communion in the first century. But you'll see these cups. I want you to understand that communion, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. I need you to understand the connection to the Jordan River. Communion is a declaration of remembering what God has done, of his faithfulness. Did you know that? That's why we do communion. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. It's a remembering of what God has done. Here in the next few minutes, we're, we're going to observe communion. But as we do this, I want us to grab a hold of the heart of why. Not religious activity. We could do that. Good, I did communion this week. But can we just take a moment, believe it, and if it is simply your salvation, can you remember the faithfulness of God in your life? Just take a moment to remember his faithfulness. This remembrance is this remembrance is it's one of those things that's easy just to do up here. I remember what Jesus has done. He came, he died, he rose victoriously. It's not what the Lord means when he says, do this in remembrance of me. Think of it as a memorial that's going to grab attention. And so I say this as we observe communion. If you're a Christian, you're invited to participate in communion. If you're not a Christian, we're glad you're here. We want you to be here. But it would be right for you not to participate. And no one's going to think anything about you not participating. But if you're a Christian who's unwilling to repent, if you're a Christian who's unwilling to say, I want to live for the glory of God, I'm asking you to repent. But if you refuse, do not take this cup. You say, but you're creating your own rules. I'm not. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul makes this very point. Now listen, we're told to examine ourselves before we take this cup. And traditionally it's taught that examine yourself and see if there's any unconfessed sin in your life. And that's part of it. But the context of this is to a church that's really jacked up. We just went through Corinthians. And Paul says, if you're not going to be unified together, if you're not going to do life God's way, if you're not going to be focused on the glory of God, he says, do not take this cup. And why? Because to take this cup and not to be focused on the glory of God is to mock the word of the work of Christ. It's to mock him. Now here's the thing. Do not hear me say, don't take this cup because that's not you. Please hear me say, go to God and beg him to help you have that desire, that want to, to live for him in all things, to glorify him. But we'll take a moment of reflection. We'll sit here in silence. I don't know, maybe some music will come in the background. Just take a moment of reflection. And this idea that our lives are to be a memorial to Jesus, to remember what Jesus has done, is to be concerned about the glory of God and his kingdom.
1 Corinthians 11, beginning verse 24, verse 23, we read, For I received from the Lord what I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread. Remember why he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember, the remembrance is he did it for the glory of God. Verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 11, we read, In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, listen to this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we drink this cup, when we eat the bread, we are proclaiming to the world, we are memorializing Jesus, and who he is. To remember who Jesus is, the bread, the cup, I don't know. It, it, it's meant to recalibrate, to recenter us. We all know this world is easily distractive. But to do this in a faith-like way is to, is, is to be recalibrated and say, God, I want to live for you as Jesus lived for you. God, I want to do life your way. Communion is a proclamation of God's faithfulness. The memorial from the Jordan is a proclamation of God's faithfulness. The Christian life is a proclamation to God's faithfulness. In other words... Moments of our lives are to be lived in light of God's faithfulness. Brother, sister, and the Lord, when did you last consider God's faithfulness? He's so good. He's so right. And not good in a way that, hey, life's happening. I mean, good in a way that his kingdom is coming and everything that is broken is going to be made right again. And because of that, we're to live in moments of faithfulness. We're to live in moments of God's faithfulness. Look at verse 24. So that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord, or that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This comparison to the Red Sea, it's not by accident. It's to remind the people of God's hand through their history. We have the completed scripture, the completed canon, From Genesis to Revelation, all of it is reminded, is there to remind us of God's faithfulness and God's plan and your role in that plan. That's why the scriptures exist. This idea of the miracle of the Jordan, it it would leave such an impression and an awe in the people's minds as they saw that memorial, that there would be a fear of God that would lead to worship. Can you, I just need you to know what it means to be an image bearer. It it, it means that you're reflecting who God is. And this is a rhetorical question. Do people know that you belong to God? Are you reflecting him? That's the meaning of your life. So how can we do this? Is this just all pie in the sky idea? Go and live for the glory of God. Good luck. We'll see you next week. We'll talk about a new series. No, no. All this is connected. So what does it look like practically? Well, we know that we're called to mark, to share, and live our lives around the faithfulness of God. So how do we do that? Let's start with this. Like like, like you have to start somewhere. Let's start with this. You have to start with a willingness to represent Jesus in your relationships. You have to start with that willingness. Listen, in this room, 
There's some of you as brothers or sisters in the Lord in which it is so easy to do life with. I mean, like, it's, it's gravy, right? But there's some in this room, it's less easy. And by the way, that's not a critique of the people that's less easy to do life with. It just means we're in relationship and we're human and we're all awkward and weird, right? So there's some natural relationships, and we gravitate toward those easy things. I'm telling you, in your relationships, to be intentional about it, don't run from the challenges people present to you, but go through them in a godly way. It's too easy to run. It hinders the body when we run. We have to have a willingness. We have to have a resolve to show the same kind of love and respect toward others as Jesus displayed. you, you got to have that in order to have this, this faithfulness, this intentional faithfulness. You have to have a clarity that your loyalty is to Jesus. Like, and that clarity isn't just to people that are in your lives. That clarity has to be to you. Like, I think it's very beneficial for you. Who am I loyal to? Who am I loyal to? To ask that question on the regular. Maybe in conversations, in this conversation, who am I being loyal to? My best interest, my perceived best interest, or am I really being loyal to Jesus? And then finally, you have to have a dependence on God. So I don't want you to leave here with, okay, I got a willingness. I got a resolve, and I, and I got this clarity. I'm going to go live for Jesus, and I'm going to muster it up. I'm going to go do that. That's religion. This fourth part, this dependency. God this is how you want me to live. In my spirit, I want to, but I know my flesh is going to resist it and reject it every step of the way. God, help me to feed the spirit and not my flesh. Like you have to have those conversations with the Lord, acknowledging that you need him to help you to be faithful. And so what does this look like? Well, what about where we live? You need to understand where you live. You are an influencer. You need to understand because of your influence where you live, you need to be consistent. You need to understand because of where you live, you are an influencer and consistency matters when you're not consistent. Because no one's perfect. Acknowledge it. Ask for forgiveness. Admit wrong. I'm telling you, that will do more for the faith life of others than a perceived idea that that guy's got it all together. Be humble. Like, we know none of us got it all together. What does this look like? Well, let's talk of our home life. I want to first talk to parents, mom, dad, children in the home, that scenario. What does it look like for you? I'm convinced of this, mom and dad, children in the home right now. Your greatest ministry opportunity are your children's friends and their parents. Absolutely convinced of it. That's the greatest opportunity. But if you will not have them in your home, if you will not work to have relationship with their parents and with your friends or with your kids' friends, that opportunity goes by the wayside. Your children's friends are an incredible opportunity. Can I tell you a twofold thing that happens? Like, like, we're called to be faithful. We're called to represent Jesus in the home. And as we love on our children's friends and, and, and we talk to them about spiritual things, we mind them of the goodness of God. Can I tell you, there's two full things that are happening. So you're being faithful there. <laughs> Your kids are watching you make a big deal about Jesus to their friends. Can I tell you, adults? Can I tell you this? An adult talking to a child can change a child's life. Just telling you, church in general, we got kids everywhere around here. I know it's a crazy world and so forth. Don't be creepy and all that. Don't be afraid to engage the kids. Your faith life can be contagious. Mom, dad, let's seize the opportunity. Mom, dad, even in the church, your kids, if you got the gift of teaching or, or, or the gift of just being relational, I'm telling you, there's an incredible gift, opportunity in Kids Rock. Elementary kids seeing their parents serve in Kids Rock, not necessarily in the elementary room. It matters. That's funny. I just made eye contact with the mom. <laughs> I did not mean to do that. <laughs> She's like, that's me he's talking to. I'm not. I'm talking in general. But, but these are opportunities. 
of discipleship. But maybe, maybe you're not a parent. Maybe many of you in here, you're in the roommate situation, living on the dorm, got an apartment or whatever. How do we, how do we bring this faithfulness, proclaiming it, demonstrating it into our living situation? I had roommates for a long time. I was blessed with incredible godly roommates. I'm telling you, roommate, the people that you live with are there for a reason. Are you concerned about them or are you just using them to help pay the rent? Right? Like, like, do you really care about them? Like, it doesn't take much to just be aware of people and say, I think they're having a bad day. Let me go check on them. And if they profess to be believers, I'm telling you, this is awkward. I get it. But if there's a group of four of you just living together and you're all four believers, one of you, please take a step in faith and say, hey, this semester, let's do something to encourage each other to be faithful to God. And let's hold each other accountable when we're not. So maybe, maybe you're going to go out party, and one of them's going to go out party and say, hey, remember, we made a covenant together that we were going to be faithful and honorable to God. Right? This is how community works in the context of home. In both, whether it's a roommate situation or a traditional home situation, you have neighbors. I will say this. It is impossible to love your neighbors if you don't know their name. It's impossible. And I also want you to acknowledge this, that our culture is very comfortable with not engaging your neighbors. In fact, I will say this, some of your neighbors are very comfortable without you engaging them. All right? Be sensitive to the Lord. Always be friendly, and maybe it's not at that time. But have you ever taken a step of faith to engage your neighbor, to just step out and get to know them, to see where it could lead? I always think about this. It's got to be really hard for people who know us, whether it's our children, whether it's our roommates, whether it's our neighbors. It's got to be really hard for them to hear us say we're Christian and show such little concern for them or such little attention to proclaiming Jesus to them. Do your children ever hear you talk about Jesus to other people? Do they hear you praying? on the behalf of other people. These things matter. So that's one way that we can flush this out. What about where you work? What about where you work? What does this look like? I think one thing that we need to understand is be a really, really good employee wherever you are. All right, don't raise your hands, but we've all had a job where you worked and it was miserable, right? Right? And and it's hard to be a really, really good employee. But it's godly to be a really good employee. Ask God to give you the strength. In your workplace, allow others to know that, you're, that you follow Jesus. And it could be this way. Hi, hi, I'm Buck. I follow Jesus. It could be that. Probably won't be effective, but you could do that. Or, or it could be out of kindness, out of respect to people. Eventually, they'd be like, well, what's your story? I'm telling you, it's happened a lot to a lot of different faithful believers. What's your story? There's something different about you. It opens the door. But you've got to be intentional. And then you've got to be intentional about building relationship with your coworkers. You're like, I work with them 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours a week. I don't want any more relationship with them. In the flesh, I, I get it. But we're not people of the flesh. He says, I will give you my Holy Spirit and you will receive power and you will be a witness to me to the ends of the world. Don't forget that the Holy Spirit is in you. So we have the home. We have the workplace to declare the faithfulness of God. But what about where we play? Do you know God's not anti-play? Like, in fact, he uses the word blessed a lot and that word just is transliterated happy. Just happy. Like, like God likes us to be happy and, and to find joy in things. So what about where you play? How do you redeem your play? I, I think one of the examples I, I, I was thinking about this week is on Tuesday night, there's, there, I don't know how many men, I think there's like 40 or so men that go and play golf. And you're like, well, how is that testifying to God's faithfulness? Well, I suspect, I've never gone, but I suspect there's brothers in the car, 
and they start talking about faithful things. But I do know for a fact that there's some guys that use it to invite their non-believing friends or their very immature friends. And the idea is that they would be around other believers. Like, play can be redeemed. Play can be redeemed, inviting people over to the game and just hanging out and letting them see how you do life together, how you and your wife interact or how you and your children interact. Not perfectly, but something distinctly different that glorifies God. Like, it is not hard to do this, to be a memorial for God. But I will say this. It's absolutely inconvenient to your flesh. It's absolutely inconvenient on every level. Your flesh will resist this. The band comes up. I want us to consider a few things and what that looks like here. We talked about the home. We talked about the workplace. We talked about play. Here at Bedrock, small group ministry is a big part of what we do. It's small groups traditionally in the home, but it could be women's groups. It could be our youth groups. They meet in small groups. Here's an idea. The idea isn't that we just meet and get together and have food, which we do, which is fun. But the idea is that in the context of those groups, there will be people that will lift up the less mature to help them mature to to desire this faithfulness, to living for the glory of God. There will be others in the room that will help them mature to continue on in their journey because life is discouraging. Jeremy said, I think Leah said it, we are absolutely convinced of this. You will grow more in your faith life in one of those groups than you will by attending a Sunday morning message. We love Sunday mornings. We really do. We love gathering. But we know that this Sunday morning gathering is limited. It does not leave space for us to love one another, to forgive one another, to bear one another's burdens, to confess our sins to one another because it's in and it's out. The small groups allow you to jump into the faith journey. We've got people out on the sidewalks, small groups, information out there. Our desire this morning is before the Lord that you would ask him to give you a resolve to simply live for his glory. And whatever is distracting from that, that you would confess and repent from it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, your love, and your mercy. God, you are holy, and you're so faithful. It doesn't matter if it was the nation of Israel coming out of the wilderness. It doesn't matter if it was different kingdoms in the Old Testament. It doesn't matter if it was Peter. It doesn't matter if it was the disciples when you were on the cross. Oh, God, we're so unfaithful. And yet, you're there. A loving father saying, child, keep following me. Keep making it about me. God, will you help us to do that today? In Jesus' name.